Welcome to part two of the RSET training, Satellite Remote Sensing for Measuring Urban Heat Islands and Constructing Heat Vulnerability Indices. In the second part of the webinar series, we'll be hearing from guest presenters, Dr. Catherine Conlon and Dr. Evan Mallon, who will present on an integrating socioeconomic data with satellite imagery for constructing heat vulnerability indices. As a reminder, this is the second part of a four-part webinar series running from August 2nd through August 11th. All webinar recordings, presentations, question and answer documents, and homework assignment can be accessed from the training page at the link below. As a reminder, there will be one homework assignment for this webinar series due by August 25th. Answers must be submitted following the instructions found on the training page. A certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars and complete the homework assignment by the deadline of August 25th. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. After participating in today's training, attendees will be able to give examples of common methods used to create heat vulnerability indices, recognize techniques for effectively using heat vulnerability indices results to inform exposure and mitigation efforts, and identify case studies showing how heat vulnerability mapping informs urban planning. It is now my pleasure to introduce our guest speakers for today's webinar, Dr. Catherine Conlon and Dr. Evan Mallon. Dr. Catherine Conlon is an assistant professor at the University of California, Davis, jointly appointed in the School of Medicine, Department of Public Health Sciences, and School of Vet Veterinary Medicine, Department of Medicine and Epidemiology. Her research focuses on characterizing how climate change influences human, animal, and environmental health. She employs environmental epidemiological study designs utilizing spatiotemporal exposure assessments and weather, climate, and land use model outputs. She also uses mixed methods for social and behavioral epidemiology. She works with state and local health practitioners to systematically characterize and implement climate change and public health actions in support of building an evidence base for climate change and health interventions. Dr. Evan Mallon is the senior analyst for Georgia Tech's Urban Climate Lab, where he focuses on urban heat island mitigation and public health response with international public, private, and academic collaborators while teaching urban environmental planning and design. He is also an ORICE Fellow in the U.S. Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention Climate and Health Program. He serves on the evaluation team collaborating with cities and states across the United States on improving climate and health adaptations through the Climate Ready States and Cities Initiative. In his work, Evan regularly collaborates with academic, business, and governmental partners, training diverse audiences on urban heat risk assessment tools and processes. Katie and Evan, over to you. Uh, all right, well, thank you very much. Uh, we are thrilled to be here. Uh, we're gonna kick off our talk uh, with the background on urban heat and heat vulnerability indices. So first a little bit on uh, heat and human health. So heat is very quickly becoming a threat for which we need to plan and prepare as exposure to extreme temperatures can have significant impacts on our health. Exposure to high temperatures can cause heat stroke, exhaustion, syncope, that means fainting, cramps, and in worst cases, even death. In fact, we expect that annual U.S. heat-related mortality may increase by up to 34,000 by mid-century. So this is a, a big problem now and one that we do expect to get worse in a warming climate. We also know that heat does not impact everyone equally, even across neighborhoods of the same city. Heat can be much higher in cities due to the urban heat island, 
which has four major drivers, including loss of vegetation, impervious materials, placed heat, and urban morphology, that is the size and shape of our cities. To identify the areas most in need of heat mitigation interventions, we can often look to areas that have higher prevalence of each of these four drivers. We may see some of these show up as indicators in our HVI. More on that later. Collectively, these contribute to what we call the urban heat island effect, elevating temperatures significantly in urbanized areas compared to nearby suburban and rural areas. Now, we often conceptualize the urban heat island as one large mass of warm air over a city, but in fact, there can be quite a range of microclimates across a city, given, uh, giving each neighborhood a unique temperature profile. And this elevated temperature does not impact everyone equally. Local microclimates are also shaped by our history. Recent research finds that red line neighborhoods, or those neighborhoods that have been historically disinvested, in some cases as a matter of policy, experience higher temperatures than neighborhoods that have not been redlined. Here we see that red line neighborhoods in Richmond, Virginia have less tree canopy, more impervious surfaces like roads and parking lots that absorb and radiate heat, and as a result, are some of the warmest neighborhoods in the city. So those who are most impacted by heat exposure also often have the fewest resources to cope with this exposure. And that's why we must look at all these different dimensions collectively of what heat can really mean for our health. So let's talk about getting that air temperature data. In climatology, the overall temperature of a city is often characterized by a single weather station, often at the airport. But we know that the urban heat island causes wide variation in temperatures within a city. Since cities tend not to have dense arrays of weather stations throughout the city, we can use a tool, uh, something like the Weather Research and Forecasting Model, or WERF, like we do in the Urban Climate Lab, to derive comprehensive air temperature data sets over an entire city. WARF can also be used to model land cover scenarios, such as thermal impacts of tree loss and greening scenarios, shown here in a study we conducted in Dallas, Texas. As you can imagine, this kind of air temperature data is quite useful, but also very time and resource intensive to construct. Your average city planning department will rarely have funding available to support analyses at this intensity and scale, though that has been improving over time. So what can we do instead? Alternatively, uh, we can do this on a local scale with air temperature sensors. Uh, at Georgia Tech, we use a dense sensor network called the Tech Climate Network to show that on campus alone, we can have urban heat island intensity ranging about seven degrees Fahrenheit. But this can also be quite labor and resource intensive to deploy, maintain, and analyze. I'll hand it over to Katie uh, to discuss these challenges from the epidemiological perspective and what we can do instead. All right, great, thanks Evan. So when we think about heat epidemiology, we're really interested in uh, looking at the impacts of an exposure, in this case, extreme heat on an outcome. And in heat epidemiology, we particularly are thinking about uh, morbidity and mortality related to heat. So that could be hospital visits. Uh, we could look at 911 calls. Uh, we know that people with cardiopulmonary or renal failure are more likely to experience um, adverse health outcomes during extreme heat events. Um, and we can use those, those health data in concert with the type of temperature data that Evan was just describing to directly attribute what the impact is uh, on, from extreme heat on those health outcomes. However, there's a very real limitation. Uh, it is uncommon uh, and less likely that we can directly attribute specific deaths or hospitalization to heat, which leads us to uh, potentially underestimate what those uh, impacts may be. And so another op option for thinking about uh, modeling or explaining extreme heat impact on health is to do statistical attribution and use statistical models that look at the relationship between temperature and mortality. Um, and these are particularly uh, useful when trying to describe relationships in, in, in space and time. 
but they also rely heavily on spatially comprehensive air temperature data, which might not always be available. So this gold standard of heat epidemiology allows us to really get a sense of what the, those impacts can be. And to add to the complexity, each model that we run has to be nimble, and it has to be able to represent the, a unique relationship to heat. And we see these unique relationships to heat uh, here in this graph, uh, illustrating the geographic differ differences in responses to heat in, the, in uh, 11 cities in the United States, and they're separated by northern and southern cities. And we can see that there's a greater effect of warmer temperatures on mortality risk in more northern cities and of colder temperatures in more southern cities. And so the, the heat epidemiology is, is not a one-size-fit-all assessment for, for health impact. And we should be thinking about uh, locations when we're, we're considering how to design interventions to protect people from extreme heat. So while the heat epidemiologic model is considered a gold standard and being able to see the, the burden of disease or the burden of mortality uh, from extreme heat, it can be resource intensive, both from the data side, whether it's co uh, collecting the data or uh, computing the data, um, or from the resource side, actually running these models. Um, and I'll note that the epidemiologic model is not as portable to communicate um, because you rely oftentimes on interpreting things like risk ratios and ra rate ratios and odds ratios. And that can be challenging if you're trying to communicate uh, heat burden in a, in a more public facing way. And so we've seen that there's a rise of the use of heat vulnerability indices because these heat vulnerability indices have a, a an, an option or a, a ability to display spatial patterns of heat risk and by using one particular one unit measure. So as Dr. Mallon just mentioned, urban heat is exacerbated by the urban heat island and that we can see these very variations in the microclimate. And that's very important if you're thinking about how to design a heat intervention. And we want, of course, our interventions to be effective, efficient, and equitable. So we want to place them in places where we know that they will, they will work. Uh, we have seen that practitioners are increasingly likely to use these heat vulnerability indices to identify high priority uh, locations for intervention. And I want to take a moment to, to, to address the term vulnerability. So colloquially, and you know, in common parlance, we often think of vulnerability as being at risk to some hazard. But we've seen in some of the literature that the term vulnerability is can be applied to, say, populations. And there is an evolving discussion around how the term vulnerability and other terms could be better used to really consider health equity framing. So we know that there are long-standing systemic, social, and health inequities that have, in some cases, been introduced or exacerbated by various levels of policy. But these put certain populations at a risk for, or at an increased risk for getting sick, having overall poor health, or having worse outcomes when they do get sick. And so these layered inequities are, are very challenging um, to, to parse out. And rather than using terminology that says a person or a population is vulnerable, we want to use language that says that we talk more about their experience. So you will be incur encountering more uh, literature, I think, moving forward that rather than talking about vulnerable populations, we'll be talking about communities and populations that experience vulnerability. So in this presentation, we will be talking about vulnerability generally. Um, and you can think about this as a reflection of how we've seen these vulnerability indices created in, in the recent past. And also think about how maybe in the future we can we can do um, a more precise job of, of characterizing populations experiencing vulnerability from, from that perspective, that they, they are experiencing vulnerability rather than embodying it. So I'd first like to introduce the Social Vulnerability Index. And this is um, a, a tool that is produced by the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. It is uh, 
it consists of 15 census variables um, that are collated to represent four main themes, the socioeconomic status theme, a uh, theme that describe, <clears throat> excuse me, describes household composition and disability, a theme that describes race, ethnicity, language, and a theme that describes housing type and transportation. And so the social vulnerability index is a way that you can uh, display in the United States a singular value to indicate this relative experience or condition of um, in a certain area. And this is important because uh, this tool um, has been used in many tools overlapping with uh, heat data. Specifically here, we can see the National Integrated Heat Health Information System uses the, the SCI uh, with heat data to identify this overlap of where we may see socially vulnerable populations uh, living in the United States along with extreme heat days. I just want to note that um, there is no one method for mapping vulnerability, and we're going to go through some of this uh, as we, we move through our, 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 our talk. So we can conceptualize vulnerability as a function of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And these components consist of indicators of this vulnerability. And so when I think of exposure, I'm really thinking about the intensity of the heat risk so how hot it gets in a particular location. And as you've mentioned, that the heat exposure is often driven by the urban heat island and is measured directly or by proxy through the drivers of the urban heat island. And so we can see here, this is a list of what we, are, what we mean when we're saying indicators of vulnerability. But if we wanted to really focus um, on some of these top measures, these measures of direct exposure, for instance, mean temperature, consecutive hot days, land surface temperature, those are direct measures of exposure. Whereas we can also have indirect or proxy measures of exposure. So we know that our pervious surface, urban density, those are drivers of temperature in cities, but they're not direct measurements of temperature itself. So these proxies of exposure are precursors to that, that vulnerability. And we can think of this as an inductive approach, that we have indicators of vulnerability um, because they've been linked to, in the literature to vulnerability. Our second component is sensitivity. And here we're describing the level at which an individual may be impacted by heat exposure given pre-existing physiological conditions that may help or may hinder these impacts. Often, we're thinking about these conditions uh, that contribute to difficulties regulating body temperature, uh, your electrolyte imbalance, and various internal stressors that might uh, increase your heat risk. And so here we have a list of indicators of sensitivity. You'll see that we have illnesses listed such as diabetes, cardiopulmonary disease, renal disease, um, respiratory and obesity status, because we know, again, from the literature that populations with these conditions are more likely to have higher risk of extreme heat uh, outcome or outcomes during extreme heat events. And lastly is this idea of adaptive capacity. So when we're thinking of adaptive capacity, we're thinking about our ability for an individual or a group um, to help them cope with exposures to high temperatures. So they may have access to resources uh, or they may not have access to resources, um, such as the ability to afford or operate air conditioning, which would then reduce a person's uh, personal exposure. And you'll notice here that we have a plus or a minus in this function. And the reason is, is because adaptive capacity can be framed as both a positive or a negative indicator of adaptive capacity. So for instance, um, of the list that we have here, higher income could be considered protective. So you would have, if you had that as an indicator, you would have a minus from your your exposure and your sensitivity. But if you have a percentage of the population living below that poverty line, you'd think of that as a contributor to vulnerability. So you'd have it as a plus. Really what we're getting at here is that when you start to think about how to create these indices, you'll want to define your variables so that they are unidirectional, so that they are conferring vulnerability. And there's more on this to come later.
And so you can see here that you have many indicators of uh, exposure, sensitivity, adaptive capacity. These are not the only ones that have been used in this in the literature. These are not these might not be appropriate for your particular project, but they are perhaps the most common. And we can even see that in the more recent years that there have been pu studies published, and this is this is a graph that's showing some uh, studies that have been published up until 2020. And what we did is we took a look at the number of indicators that they use, and you can see that it ranges from, in some of these uh, HVIs, it ranges from five indicators to 25 indicators. So you really want to have a sense of th that this is not a one size fits all, um, and that you really want to create your HVI such that it informs your particular location. And I'll note that although these are published, peer reviewed published papers um, on heat vulnerability indices, uh, there is a gray literature that uh, is available and has perhaps more information on the types of indicators that are being, being used. And now we'll move uh, into talking about constructing heat vulnerability indices with Evan. Uh, so we'll begin this section uh, discussing some of the origins of HVIs, uh, or indices in general, with the ecological method, then cover some common construction techniques, uh, which we'll expand upon in our next session, and wrap up with some HVI sensitivities that we want you to keep in mind as you're making your own HVIs. So back in the 1960s, uh, Ian McHarg developed the foundations of these additive overlay techniques with what he called the ecological method. This was designed for land use projects, not for heat, but the principles still apply here. The steps were to identify a range of known impacts this project may have on the natural landscape, create separate layers for each impact with areas of high, medium, and low value, and finally to overlap the various layers to identify zones of minimum total societal impacts, or in other words, the most ideal location for this development. This may include uh, social, human-centric layers, such as scenic value, recreation value, or residential value, uh, as well as some more ecosystem-based layers, such as forests and wildlife. Now, in 1969, before modern geographic information systems, or GIS technologies, this was conducted using transparent plastic overlays. Uh, here's an image of these overlays representing these overlapping values and the resulting ideal path that came from it. Uh, here's another schematic uh, on the left here illustrating how those layers can be combined to identify the ideal location for our intervention. But this method comes with two inherent problems. The first is that it adds together layers assuming they are of equal importance, which may not be the case in practice if one layer is more important than another for your intervention. Second, and relatedly, this method assumes that individual factors are completely independent. That is, one factor has no reasonable relationship with another. Is that the case, though, with our HVI indicators? Uh, let's look first at some exposure measures. For example, if you include land surface temperature in your HVI, in addition to some proxy measures such as impervious surface and vegetation, that may artificially inflate your exposure because we know that these layers are correlated. Where you have higher impervious surfaces and less vegetation, you will generally find higher land surface temperatures as well. Similarly, if we turn to sensitivity and adaptive capacity, we can see that including both older adults who may be more likely to live alone and living alone as a separate measure, uh, you may again be inflating the risks of social isolation in your HVI. We also know that those who have lower income or wealth also tend to be those who do not have high rates of air conditioning use. So this idea of artificial weighting works with adaptive capacity as well. Keep these in mind uh, as we move forward with our construction techniques. If you're concerned about closely related indicators, you may run a correlation matrix on your data set and remove any indicators that are too closely correlated to reduce the threats of autocorrelation. More on this next time. 
So as we mentioned earlier, there are many options available when constructing an HVI, but most will start with a step of normalization and aggregation. Normalization means that we place each indicator on the same scale. For example, a proportion of the population with a certain condition ranging zero to one. This standardizes the indicators, so none inherently elevate the HVI just based on their scale alone. They're then aggregated and must be constructed such that the, an increase in the indicator translates to an increase in vulnerability. So for example, if you have vegetation as an indicator, you don't want to include it in the HVI as it is. Higher proportions of vegetation generally do not mean more vulnerability. Uh, you may rearrange this instead to be lack of vegetation or proportion of a geography without vegetation. Again, we'll talk more about this next time. Um, we then have a decision to make about whether or not we want to weight our indicators. Some HVIs do assume equal importance of each indicator, and so they are equal weight, while other practitioners may determine relative importance of the indicators and weight them accordingly. Some use expert judgment to determine which indicators may be more or less important based on your local context, your local population. Uh, more on this weighting in just a moment. Finally, many HVIs will use a statistical technique called Principal Components Analysis, or PCA. This is a dimension reduction technique that also reduces the threat of autocorrelation. So many HVIs with high numbers of indicators will use this technique. It produces statistically independent factors we can then associate with the components of vulnerability, that is exposure, sensitivity, or adaptive capacity. However you construct the HVI, you'll also need a scoring mechanism. A common one researchers use is the Reed et al. 2009 scheme, here on the right, in which the indicators are converted to z-scores, then scored according to the scheme you see here in this table before summing them up uh, to derive their final HVI score. You'll notice all of these uh, component scores are positive. This means that there are no inherently protective indicators. They all do contribute, but in varying amounts to your overall HVI score. So let's revisit some considerations in weighting. So say that you have an HVI made of these indicators. We have for exposure, land surface temperature. For sensitivity, we have diabetes prevalence, non-white, uh, over age 65, living alone, over age 65, and living alone. For adaptive capacity, we have living below the poverty line, less than high school education, no air conditioning access, no central air conditioning access. You may notice that there's some relationships between some of these indicators here. Now, under an equal weight additive scheme, you may unknowingly be weighting your HVI towards certain vulnerability components that simply have more indicators. Here, we are, in a sense, drowning out the influence of exposure by including only one exposure indicator. This is a case where you may want to weight the results equally across the components to ensure that we don't lose the influence of exposure on our final score. For example, you may aggregate all of these indicators together, but then weight them such that each grouping of indicators has a one-third contribution to your overall HVI. In a sense, you're then uh, comparing exposure to sensitivity and adaptive capacity as equal measures in your HVI. So let's move through various complexities of HVI construction. We're gonna start with the unweighted additive overlay or even something like a simplified HVI. In this case, this refers to one that maybe has very few indicators, say only one for each component of vulnerability. So in these low complexity models of HVI construction, we simply take our indicators, clean them up to ensure they are all unidirectional. That is higher indicators mean higher vulnerability. We normalize them. This could be proportions, this could be uh, converting to z-scores, however you would like to normalize them. And we aggregate them, and then we score them for our final HVI score. Moving up in complexity, uh, in a weighted additive overlay, we'll follow the same procedure as, as the previous one, but with added weights before aggregation. Whether and to what extent you weight is up to you, but will influence your final result. More on that in just a minute. Finally, under the principal components analysis scheme, we will develop our statistically independent factors before aggregating. These indicators will load on each factor 
in varying amounts. So we can generally characterize each factor by its relationship with the indicators, making them primarily associated with particular components of vulnerability. Again, more on this in the next session. So in the end, we have a lot of options for HVI construction and with highly varying complexity. But in any case, I want to remind everyone that it is very important to ensure your indicators are unidirectional. This will be necessary for your HVI, regardless of construction method, no matter how you are building them. This is something that you will want to keep in mind. So what does our HVI show us? The range of HVI scores, regardless of scale, show us a relative vulnerability across the chosen geography. This is a very important takeaway. HVIs will show you how vulnerable an area of a city, state, country, whatever geography you've chosen, as compared to other areas in that same geography. This means those areas with higher HVI scores are our priority areas for intervention, as compared to other areas in that same geography. HVIs are also quite sensitive to your HVI design choices, so we'd like to highlight a few today. This includes sensitivities to inputs or the indicators you select for the HVI, the construction method, and the scale of the analysis. We'll illustrate these in one city, Detroit, Michigan. Uh, Katie and I are a bit biased, both being from Michigan. Uh, so first is inputs. You'll need to select your inputs very carefully, and we recommend that you select only indicators that are relevant to your selected intervention. Here we show just how important indicator choice is on your outcome. We show this uh, in this map of Detroit, not just one HVI, but four. This shows how frequently each census tract was in the top 25% of vulnerability across our four different HVI maps. All that we varied across this set of HVIs was the exposure indicator using different data sources for vegetation and impervious surfaces. And you can see that this choice alone resulted in some widely varying results. The areas in black had high agreement across the HVIs, being in the top 25% vulnerability across all four of them. But any of the other shades of gray mean that the HVI differed based on our inputs. This is an important takeaway because if you rely on only one HVI to guide your decisions, the design of that HVI may send your interventions, your investments, your efforts into entirely different neighborhoods. The construction method may also significantly impact your result. Across these four maps here on the right, we use the same set of indicators each time, but varied the construction method across the scale of complexity that you see there on the left. Here again, we show that even with common indicators, your construction choices may send your interventions into entirely different neighborhoods. So it's important to discuss your results in the context of the HVI design that you've chosen so you know how best to intervene and where. Finally, the scale of analysis will impact your results as well. I've circled here two neighborhoods that do not show up uh, at all in a tracked scale HVI there on the left but do show up even with high frequency across HVIs uh, at the block group scale. That is a smaller unit of geography. This means that even with common methods and indicators, your uh, scale will also impact your results. Why is that? The smaller units of geography may be more stratified in their land cover or demographics. A block group consisting of mostly a park will look very different when you take into account the rest of the tract in which it sits. So even just the scale of your analysis, which shape file you choose to use for your HVI will influence your outcomes. So how do we know that we can trust HVIs uh, with all these uncertainties? Well, fortunately, some research has focused on validating their results using observed or modeled health outcomes to see if higher vulnerability does truly translate to more heat-related health impacts. Here we see in, in some research from uh, NIAC et al., this is in New York, the state of New York that we showed earlier, um, that higher HVI score does correlate with higher heat stress cases and age-adjusted prevalence rates and ratios. This means the HVI that they constructed 
uh, does seem to reflect on the ground conditions of heat and health. Another study by Meyer et al. out of 2014 validated the use of HVI mapping techniques by correlating HVI scores with statistically derived heat related mortality data in the state of Georgia. They found a 13.4% increase in mortality for every increase of uh, one point in their HVI score on what they called oppressive days with extreme heat, and a 12.4% increase in mortality for each unit increase in HVI score, even on non oppressive days. Uh, furthermore, the authors found no statistically significant relationship between HVI score and mortality on oppressive days for counties with low HVI scores, but the relationship became significant at higher HVI values. This finding lends support to the utility of HVI mapping techniques in identifying areas with greater vulnerability as we observe on the ground health impacts. But other research finds mixed results. Uh, in Dallas, Texas, uh, we in the Urban Climate Lab uh, found that comparing our gold standard epidemiological model that we discussed at the beginning of our session today to a common HVI uh, here on the right finds an R squared of only 0 0.04. This means that again, the choice of model will determine where our priority neighborhoods will be. The choice of your model may send all of that effort, your resources, your attention, these interventions into completely different neighborhoods based on the decisions that you make. But if we break the HVI down into its constituent parts, we get a better model fit using the multivariate spatial regression. We also find that only a few of our indicators strongly predict heat-related mortality so that we may not, uh, not have needed the entire HVI to guide our decisions. Really, it's only a few components of it, a few indicators that really did uh, predict this uh, heat-related health outcome. So maybe we don't need the entire HVI in aggregate, but maybe just a few indicators instead. One model we can create when we do have health data is called a supervised HVI. We can correlate our individual indicators with health outcome data when available to determine which indicators really do correlate with health outcomes, leading to a more precise HVI that is unique to your city. Uh, but I'll pass it over to Katie to discuss more on uh, how we can best be constructing our HVIs and how we can use them in practice. Great, thanks Evan. So now we want to think about how we can use these HVIs in practice. As I mentioned, they are becoming more common uh, in citing certain interventions uh, that address extreme heat. And perhaps two of the most common that we see are the uh, implementation of cooling centers, which are locations uh, where air conditioning or cool uh, air is available to anybody to enjoy experience during an extreme heat day uh, and the other is tree planting and so tree planting is is really getting at uh, the drivers of urban heat of the urban heat island so as you may recall impervious surface and low vegetation can drive that urban heat island so a tree planting campaign may address that urban heat island by reducing the ambient temperature and so we'll look at this these two particular interventions within the context of uh, vulnerability mapping that was done for the city of Atlanta. And so what we see here is the city of Atlanta and uh, PCA, so Principal Component Analysis HVI. So an HVI that was created using PCA included these 10 indicators. And so what we're seeing here is an HVI that is built with all 10 indicators ha has this output that produces a relative scoring of heat vulnerability across the city. And you may notice that the southwest um, and western parts of the city are shown to have the higher HVI scores. But as Evan mentioned, because you have so many indicators, this might not be the precision that you need if, say, you are focusing your intervention on something specific. Say, I'm interested in looking at those sensitivity components. And so if I were thinking I want to focus on sensitivity and I'm concerned mostly about people over the age of 65, 
I may be thinking about an intervention like a cooling center. And in a cooling center, if, if, or with the over the age of 65, if we map just that indicator, we, we get this map right here. And it highlights those southwestern, western parts of the city where we have higher proportion of residents who are over the age of 65. And that might show us this is a perhaps a good location for citing a cooling center if we were focusing on increasing um, coverage for people who are most sensitive to extreme heat. But on the other hand, if I were focusing on exposure, say for instance, I'm particularly concerned about ambient temperatures, and I map the land surface temperature, here I would identify a completely opposite neighborhood in the city of Atlanta, so east side of Atlanta. This might be appropriate, say, if I were thinking about um, a tree planting campaign, uh, because I'd be able to identify locations where those temperatures are highest and perhaps ameliorate or reduce that urban heat island by increasing vegetation. So, if you we were to start from a general HVI and just look at the sensitivity and adaptive capacity components, we can see here in the top grouping that these are the types of strategies that would be most effective in the locations that we highlighted. So in that map that's on the right-hand side, mapping sensitivity, particularly people over the age of 65, we might identify that for, for uh, short-term emergency response, activities that we could place cooling centers, introduce phone trees uh, in this location. If we use uh, exposure indicators to inform our intervention, we might be focusing more on longer term or heat mitigation type uh, interventions, interventions that are designed to reduce exposure, uh, such as tree planting, introducing cool materials, then we might say we want to plant this in or institute this in the eastern side of the city. With the overall vulnerability map, we can see an, a, a, all of the above type of response. So we can think about it from both a short-term and a long-term perspective. We can identify areas of highest priority and perhaps identify locations where we could institute pilot projects. And this is important. So as you may recall, I mentioned that heat vulnerability indices are an incredibly useful communications tool. They uh, display a spatial distribution of vulnerability in a location, and they start to have uh, an impact where you begin to ask questions about what's happening in this location, what's happening in that location, and that's an opportunity for engaging community members to talk about what their local needs are and their concerns are, and what types of heat intervention could be designed appropriately to reduce the impact on those populations that you believe are most at risk. So we can think about opportunities here to design heat intervention with the use of HVIs um, through a co-production of knowledge strategy by incorporating work with our community members so that we can encourage both behavioral change and build social capital. And this is important because if, say, you are trying to implement a cooling center, you would want to make sure that where you're citing that cooling center is in a location that is going to be used, that is in a location that people can access. And many times we've, we've been finding that the connection with communities to ground truth these types of intervention sightings is critical to the success of the intervention. So let's take a look at some examples. So uh, in New York City, there is a program called Be a Buddy, uh, and the Be a Buddy program has identified more than 1,300 New Yorkers who are at risk uh, during extreme heat emergencies, and they did so by producing a heat vulnerability map, and you can see that on the bottom left. And that map shows neighborhoods uh, whose residents are more at risk for dying during and immediately following extreme heat. And it uses a statistical model to summarize the most important social and environmental factors that contribute to the neighborhood heat risk. And those factors were surface temperature, green space, whether or not a home had air conditioning, 
and the percentage of populations who are low income or non-Latinx Black. And so in this project, um, the Be A Buddy volunteers help neighbors locate local resources, um, such as a space to cool off during an extreme heat event if they lack air conditioning. Um, they've been able to focus their activities in the, in the most at risk, high, most at risk and high vulnerable population or locations here in the city. Um, and they've done some preliminary analyses that have found that this project has both increased community connectivity and community capacity. And this is important, as we know in the literature, that connectivity and community capacity are protective um, characteristics uh, during extreme heat events. On the west coast of the US, we have uh, the Los Angeles County Climate Smart LA program. And in this project, they produced, as you can see here on the right, um, a, a vulnerability map that was answering the question about where, which areas of LA County should be prioritized for green infrastructure solutions. And so they produced this heat vulnerability map by identifying areas that were vulnerable to heat, heat both in terms of their exposure and in terms of infrastructure, so temperature and uh, or excuse me, exposure and sensitivity. So temperature and populations that are most sensitive to, during extreme heat events. Um, since they have identified green infrastructure ahead of time as being one of the most most successful, most possible solutions for mitigating that urban heat island. And so they focus on four main areas. The first is connectivity. So they want to identify opportunities to increase transit and trails that provide carbon-free transportation um, that allow residents to visit and connect with each other. The second is cool areas. They want to produce shady green spaces that reduce that urban heat island effect and can protect people from heat waves when they're living in those spaces. They want to identify uh, opportunities for increasing absorption, particularly of rainfall. So they're thinking about water smart parks, playgrounds, and green alleys, so that these locations can help reduce flooding and recharge drinking water supplies while saving energy for water management. And lastly, they're using this map to identify areas that need protection so that they can strategically place shoreline parks and natural lands to buffer cities from what we know will be happening around rising seas, coastal storms, and flooding. And so today we've reviewed major considerations for the use and implementation of heat vulnerability indices. And primarily, we want you to be thinking a lot about the inputs that you're selecting and that you're putting into your vulnerability index and how you are constructing that index and the scale at which you're going to be interpreting that index and implementing it for the purpose of informing effective and efficient heat interventions. And we want you to know that these HVIs are communication tools that not just that are not just useful for putting out there, but instead to use them as an opportunity to engage with your community members and to iterate where appropriate. Because as we learn more about what our communities are experiencing with extreme heat on the ground, the better and more informative we can make these heat vulnerability indices so that we can implement efficient and protective interventions. And here are our work cited, and with that, we look forward to taking any questions. Thank you both for such a wonderful presentation. We've already been receiving questions from participants and for those online who would like to ask a question to Dr. Conlin and Dr. Mallon, please enter your questions in the question and answer box. We will answer them in the order they were received. We will post the question and answer document to the training website following the conclusion of the webinar. Below is the contact information for Dr. Conlin and Dr. Mallon, along with links to the training page and the RSET website.
we encourage everyone to sign up on the RSET listserv for notifications to upcoming webinars. Each month, we offer new remote sensing training on land, air quality, disasters, climate, and water resources. We will now transition to the question and answer session of today's training. We appreciate your attention and please submit your questions if you haven't already. We will get through as many as possible in the time remaining. Thank you. And one more time, a thank you to everybody that has been submitting your questions. We've, we've gotten some really good questions so far, uh, but we still have plenty of time today uh, left in part two of today's training. We have roughly 40 minutes. So if you do have a question, uh, there is no such thing as a bad question. We, we do encourage you to, to enter it and we will uh, address it in the time remaining. So jumping right into it, question number one. I saw in the material that one of the examples of exposure is homes without air conditioning. But air conditioning access is also one of the examples of adaptive capacity. So homes without air conditioning or lack of access to air conditioning is an indicator of exposure or adaptive capacity. I, I can address this one. Um, that, that's a good eye. You're absolutely right. Uh, air conditioning is a difficult one to characterize. Um, sometimes it can be classified as exposure uh, since it directly impacts levels of heat exposure while at home. Research has shown that AC access is one of the most important factors determining magnitude and frequency of extreme heat exposure. We are home most of the time, especially now in, in a pandemic. Uh, and so uh, it is one of the key determinants of our level of heat exposure. So it can be classified as a direct heat exposure indicator, but it can also be classified as adaptive capacity when framed as AC access or the ability to own and operate air conditioning. Uh, this is often more related to wealth or income or the ability to afford the costs of regular air conditioning. So this is, uh, something that we really uh, can classify as either. It really depends on what your uh, HVI is intending to address, how you are designing your HVI, what intervention do you have in mind? Is it really more about reducing that exposure or is it more about granting more access to air conditioning when people choose to use it at home? So for example, um, there are more and more uh, regulations nowadays uh, that set uh, as part of, say, a building code or a local legislation, um, your uh, maximum temperature at home, or you are legally required to have um, air conditioning uh, access, or uh, someone like a landlord may have uh, be required to provide access to that. Uh, in areas where heat really is a problem. There are also several programs uh, nowadays that are more geared towards that uh, energy burden, as, as we say, which is the cost of owning and operating air conditioning. So there are certain low income energy assistance programs, there's one called LIHEAP, uh, that helps uh, lower income uh, households be able to afford air conditioning when they need it most. And so this is uh, all about framing. You know, what do you want your uh, HBI to accomplish? Uh, because you have a certain intervention in mind. So really that can land in either column. We should make it very clear that we have characterized uh, these as sensitivity, exposure, or adaptive capacity, but there's really no single resource that defines exactly how they should be characterized. Uh, it's kind of more so what you have in mind. We are providing these more so as guidelines. Uh, for how you could characterize these various um, indicators for your intervention. Evan, thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate that answer for question number one. So question number two, how is the relative risk of mortality compared to or related to surface temperature? Yeah, this is a really great question. I just want to make sure, Sean, you can hear me? Yeah, Katie, we sure can. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so if you recall in the beginning of the presentation, um, I mentioned that there are different types of 
epidemiologic models that we can do um, to, to relate essentially an exposure to an outcome. And in this case, what we're talking about as exposure would be surface temperature. Uh, and the outcome here is the, the questioner asks is about mortality. So we can really use epidemiologic and statistical models to look at the relationships between, say, an increase in surface temperature and an increase in mortality. Um, so first, you need to have that health data. Uh, and so we might look at, say, deaths due to diabetes, because as we mentioned, we know that diabetes, or folks who have diabetes, um, have a really tough time staying cool when it gets hot outside. So unfortunately, they tend to be more at risk to uh, death or hospitalization uh, when it gets hot outside. Um, so we might take that data, that health data, that diabetes, uh, the proportion of, say, people who die on a heat day um, who have diabetes, and estimate the risk of them dying, essentially. And so if you wanted to, to look at the relative risk, so there's two ways we can think about relative risk, and I don't want to get too epidemiologic here, but we can think about the relative risk of, say, a person with diabetes dying on a hot day compared to a person without diabetes dying on a hot day. Um, that would be one way that you would, say, assess, assess the relationship, the relative risk of mortality um, for folks with diabetes when it gets hot outside. Or you could compare, you could say, we are actually interested in temp a certain threshold of temperature. Um, and we want to compare what is the risk of a person um, dying due to diabetes on a hot day above a certain temperature compared to the risk of a person dying due to diabetes on a not as hot day. So there are different ways that we can assess that mortality or health burden relationship with temperature. And really the way that we do that is through different types of epidemiologic models that use different types of statistical approaches. Um, so it's a bit outside of what we do with the HVI. Um, you can use a lot of the same data to create your HVI, but you're not able to really um, answer this question about how much does an increase in temperature relate to an increase in disease burden. Great, thanks so much, Katie. Uh, question number three, what is a good resource to best not drown out heat vulnerability index weightings? Sure, so I can address this one. There are uh, two papers that I find particularly helpful and they're listed here. There's a, a bow and a wolf, both in 2015, and they, they both contain um, a, a quite an extensive literature review on some of the methods that we talk about uh, here in this training and, and we'll continue to talk about a little bit more in the next training. So there is not really one go-to resource on uh, this is the absolute uh, be all end all of how HVIs should be constructed and that is a good thing. Uh, that is because HVIs really should be designed with your city, your interventions in mind that local context is so important. So the weighting scheme that you design will ultimately be up to you. Um, it may actually make more sense to be weighting much more heavily towards one indicator or another if that is your intervention. Like Katie had mentioned, if you have a, say, a tree planting campaign in mind, you probably do want to uh, really highlight or weight more heavily that exposure variable, but not forgetting some of our sensitivity and adaptive capacity to know where that tree planting will have the greatest benefit for whom. So there's not really one go-to resource on this, unfortunately, but I have posted these two papers that I found to be particularly useful in terms of discussing some of the, um, some of the specific mechanics of how you can build HVIs and as well as some of the considerations that uh, come up when it comes to things like weighting. Uh, before we, we wrap up this question, I'll also just say that um, often in the literature, uh, it's noted that HVI weighting schemes are based on expert opinion. So there are several researchers who will go out and seek people who, who might know about what might be most appropriate. And it's not just local academics, it is also community members, it's community leaders. It's saying, we have an intervention in mind, we want your help in determining how to deploy this. And this is what we recommend 
is the, the ideal time to be using an HVI. Uh, this is where we can be building them together, co-producing this kind of knowledge with those local experts who, again, may be uh, just some average community members who know the challenges that they face um, in their community, in their neighborhood, and at home. And so uh, this is a time when then you can get their input on really what are the most important challenges that we should be addressing through these interventions. And so that is uh, probably one of your best resources is that local knowledge on how you should be designing your HVI and how you can best be weighting or not weighting those indicators. Great, thank you so much, Evan. Uh, going, moving on, question number four, how can we use heat vulnerability indices to compare two cities' conditions? Sure, so I, I can speak to this one as well. Um, I think absolutely you can use an HPI uh, to compare two cities to each other. And I would recommend that if you're making this comparison, that you use the exact same HVI indicators and construction methods. You don't want any confounding variables. You don't want to use two different HVIs for these two different cities. Because remember, the HVI is most important or is most useful when used as a, a tool to highlight relative priority. And relative priority could be within the same city, but between neighborhoods. It can be between two different cities. Um, but you should be using the same HVI to do that. So I'd also recommend pooling your data across the two cities such that the, uh, the mean and the Z scores include all data within each indicator, not just within each city. That will give you a much more direct comparison. This city here, this neighborhood in this city is more vulnerable than these neighborhoods in this other city because you've been able to show that on a Z-score basis, this kind of number of standard deviations from the mean across the two cities, that this is a higher priority for intervention. Um, so that really will let you highlight the relative differences between the two cities. However, I would not recommend comparing two cities in very different climates. Uh, the physiological acclimatization or the local population's unique relationship with heat may be very different. So if you compare a city in a very uh, cool climate to a city in a very warm climate, naturally you are going to have uh, the much cooler city show up as less vulnerable. This is where we're going to have uh, this uh, relative prioritization called into question a little bit. Um, so I would not recommend doing uh, too large of an analysis. Relatedly, I don't find to, uh, depending on the size of your country, national scale HVIs to be particularly useful because we do often end up just highlighting that the warmer cities uh, in warmer climates are the most vulnerable, especially if you have heavily weighted HVIs towards exposure variables. Um, so it really just depends on your scale of what you would like to do. It also depends on the scale of your intervention. If you're talking about national policy, maybe a national scale HVI makes sense. Where do we put that money? You're talking about a state level policy. Again, maybe a state makes sense. I work most often at the urban scale, you know, where our urban level decision maker is going to have the most input. Um, and so that is often the scale at which I am working and where I see HVIs to often be the most uh, useful. But again, it's entirely up to how you're designing your policies and designing your interventions. Great, thanks, Evan. Question number five. What would you recommend we do for a heat vulnerability index if there is not data for all subdivisions of a geography? For example, if some census tracts had data and some do not? Yeah, this is a great question. <laughs> so it's not uncommon that if you were pulling data, you'll find that there's, you know, some missing uh, data for certain variables. Uh, so for instance, we, I had this happen when I was working with a uh, Detroit index. Um, there were large industrial complexes that essentially are their own geographies. And so if I wanted to pull or I wanted to look at, say, population demographics, they didn't have that type of information, right, because nobody lives there. Um, so there is a bit of, a, 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 you know, discretion to the the scientist to the author to actually decide how they want to handle this missing data so in my opinion it really comes down to how much you're missing so if i have say like two to five percent of my tracks missing data oftentimes i will just 
omit that or identify that as like a, a missing area or an area that doesn't have data. And we'll actually illustrate this. This is something that we'll be doing in part three. Um, but if if you have a large portion of your of your study extent um, that doesn't have data, you might want to think about whether that variable is actually giving you much information. So um, let's say that you have more than 20% of your of your geographies missing information. Um, you might want to think, okay, this is not this. Is, I mean, that's a large portion, I think, of your study data set that you would maybe want to, to leave out um, and maybe look for another indicator that could do something similar. So, for instance, it, and I saw a, a question that was asking about AC prevalent or AC data. AC is very challenging, especially in the United States, to get um, information on. So I don't believe that it is currently a, a, a variable that is in the U.S. Census. Um, but there are estimates of AC prevalence um, from, I believe the CDC has that, and some local uh, data repositories have that information. So you may be able to get it from, I think, uh, tax assessors data database. But if you are looking at data that is, say, at the county level, which is often what we see for AC data in the U.S., but you are looking at a much more refined scale, spatial scale, say something that's a census tract. And for those who are not familiar with U.S. administrative boundaries, um, a county is a much larger geographic space. It includes usually many cities, um, but a, a, a census tract is something that's capturing two to 4,000 people. So it's, it's a much more indicative of, say, um, neighborhoods within a city. So if I wanted to use that AC data that's at the, at the county level, but all my analysis is being done at the track level, that UC data or AC data doesn't really give us much information. So I probably would drop it um, and see if I could find something that's uh, a better substitute at the um, track level. And if there isn't something that's available at the track at the level at which you're doing your analysis, then it might be one of those things, it is one of those things that you'd have to really consider when you start to interpret what your what your index is telling you when you map it out. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of an insight into how the decisions are made between what to do when you don't have as much data as, as you would want. Great, thanks Katie. Uh, question number six, is it possible to evaluate the effects of measures taken to reduce the urban heat island? Is it possible to measure what measure is the most effective for which place? And I will say, Katie, I, I believe that Evan uh, is helping with his child. So I don't know if you want to answer. But... I, I'm happy. I'm happy to address this one. I may pass it to uh, Katie, though, if he acts up. You're right. My my son is participating in the training right now. Um, I I would say yes. Uh, you absolutely can uh, evaluate these, uh, but it can be quite difficult. Um, there are two different things that we might want to be evaluating. Uh, here in the Urban Climate Lab, we do regularly evaluate um, heat mitigation policies, but it's through our modeling that I mentioned at the very beginning of today's session. So we build models. Uh, this is uh, local scale uh, climate models uh, under, say, baseline conditions. So we know how hot certain neighborhoods can get, how frequently, uh, how regularly, what is the intensity and frequency of this extreme heat exposure across uh, an entire city at high resolution. We can do that under baseline conditions, but we can also do that under heat mitigation scenarios like albedo enhancement, that is uh, reflective roofing and pavements, uh, white roofs, uh, lighter colored pavements that reflect sunlight rather than absorbing it, uh, or something like a tree planting initiative. You know, you have a policy that requires a certain minimum level of uh, canopy coverage per neighborhood. We can model that. And that helps us evaluate both the cooling effects of these strategies and the public health impacts. But these are all of infrastructural strategies. This is more so on the scale of exposure. Uh, and this can be quite a long-term uh, type of strategy. This goes more into uh, a capital improvements plan, something like that, that may take, say, 10 or 20 years to fully build out. We can model what that looks like now, but it's going to be difficult for us to really track how that performs until those trees can start growing. You know, the, the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. Uh, 
Uh, and so this is something that can take some time unless we model it. However, the other thing that we can evaluate is the social and behavioral interventions. These are more difficult to evaluate uh, without pilot projects. Um, the strategies that Dr. Kalman mentioned, uh, such as phone trees or cooling centers, those can be evaluated once they are implemented. We can start with these kinds of pilot projects and we can use HVIs to help us determine where to start with those projects. Where is our highest priority for intervention? Where will this intervention be the most useful? So we can start with an HVI to identify those. We then can go to those communities and work with them to try and uh, run some of these kinds of pilots. Let's open a cooling center. Let's see how it performs. This is the kind of thing that does not take necessarily 20 years, but it might take multiple years. You might uh, enact a pilot project and then evaluate it over the summer, uh, learn how you can improve it, do it again the following summer, do it again the following summer, evaluate it each time, and try to see how, we, how can we improve this program over time. That then really helps with the uh, kind of evaluation of should we be doing this further? How could we be doing it better? How can we better serve our local population this way? So you can certainly evaluate both, but both will take a little bit of time, and depending on the intervention, will be evaluated in quite different ways. Great, thank you, Evan. Question number seven. Is there a method for adequately blending data from different scales, such as MODIS or Landsat, with administrative bounds? Yeah, so this is a great question, and we actually will be discussing this in, in much more detail in part three, so I'll just leave it there to, to lure you into our next uh, session. Good point, Katie. We hope you all stick around for next Tuesday, where you'll be learning a lot more about blending satellite data to create heat vulnerability index, indices. Question number eight, mitigation strategies and interventions are in essence area-specific. Is there a list of conventional interventions which can be the basis for suggesting these? Absolutely, yes. This is a, a fantastic question because it is uh, one of the most important takeaways, I think, from, from this uh, session and the next is that you should be designing your uh, interventions to be context specific. They should reflect what your local population is facing in terms of challenges when it comes to heat exposure. Um, and so one resource that I can recommend that I think is, is great is the US EPA uh, Heat Island Compendium. Uh, that's freely available online. It's actually a great website, but also comes across in a series of PDF documents that really does document well uh, the types of strategies that can be taken and what uh, research supports those interventions. And so that is something that um, I recommend everyone go to uh, both inside the United States and outside. It's a great first place to go. Um, but it is uh, very important for you to be designing your interventions uh, with that local context in mind. For example, if you live in a very hot and dry climate, it may not be most appropriate to recommend water intensive tree planting campaigns when the climate won't support it. Uh, this may be something where instead, uh, if we think of places like, for example, in the United States, Phoenix, Arizona, uh, where it may actually be most effective and in the short term to be using albedo enhancement, that is using these white roofs or cool pavements, which they are already pursuing quite aggressively and effectively. Uh, that reflects the sunlight, keeps it from soaking up in these building materials and heating up, exacerbating the urban heat island. This is again from an exposure perspective, um, that may be a little bit more appropriate for the climate, which is again, very hot, very dry. This is also going to be um, very context specific for other types of interventions. If you live in a very hot, dry climate, uh, again, say in the United States, it may be quite common for you to have air conditioning. You could live in a city that has 95% uh, or higher air conditioning access across your entire city because it is regularly exposed to these high temperatures. So the, the people building these homes regularly will add air conditioning as a component. But uh, if you live in the far north, you live in say Canada, uh, that is 
a place where it's pretty rare to have air conditioning. And the types of heat exposure that they are experiencing now with these recent heat waves is very rare and very new, but increasing in frequency, duration, and intensity. We've observed this. Uh, and so this is something where you may then need more of the social and behavioral uh, kinds of uh, interventions. This may be where you open more cooling centers because people don't have this air conditioning regularly at home. So they need to go somewhere else in the event that they have this extreme but relatively short-term heat exposure like these heat waves we've been experiencing. And so that context is going to be quite important for determining your strategies, and that's gonna be up to you to determine what is most appropriate. However, there are existing resources like this US EPA Heat Island Compendium that I recommend everyone as a good place to start. Thank you, Evan. Uh, question number yeah, nine. Yeah, if I could just... Yeah, please, If I could just add to that. Sorry, yeah, I just wanna add that, you know, <laughs> To, for everyone to keep in mind, this is a fairly burgeoning area of research. So the types of mitigation or urban heat island mitigation techniques um, have really been starting to to like take more hold and really get a lot of attention in the public health field, which means that we are at the beginning stages of really evaluating from a, from a health perspective what types of interventions protect against ad adverse outcomes. So not to just add to everybody's to-do list, but I think that it's, it's worthwhile keeping track of the literature, if you can, um, on heat interventions and public health outcomes, um, because I, I feel as though every day, every week, I'm getting a new paper that's starting to beginning, starting to look at this. Um, and so if you feel as though you can't really identify an intervention that would be appropriate for your location because you want to root it in, say, I can anticipate protecting this number of people from extreme heat and it will result in a reduction in heat burden or heat illness burden. It's because some of that information has yet to, to be into the, you know, the literature. So we're, we're very much at the beginning and I would actually really pause it as something to think about if you are thinking about how to reduce your urban heat island and, and want to implement some type of intervention to also build into that an evaluation of the public health burden because we really do have, I think, an opportunity here to start characterizing uh, what types of interventions uh, for around heat can be protective for health. Great, Katie, thanks so much for adding that. So that's a, that's a really important point and, and thank you, Evan, as well. Uh, really important topic, and and again, it's uh, the literature is 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 constantly being added to. So you know, please do, uh, as Katie uh, suggested, uh, you know, try to start uh, doing literature review and and keeping current with the uh, the current trends in this field. So question number nine for the exposure component, most of the models are considering land surface temperature, that is essentially surface urban heat island as an exposure component. However, canopy layer urban heat island determines heat stress. How can canopy urban heat island be estimated? Are there any models to estimate mean radiant temperature in urban areas? Yes, uh, there absolutely are. And this is a great question because there are differences between uh, land surface temperature and even nearby air temperature. And I know the literature uh, is a bit mixed. Uh, there are some studies that have found a uh, fairly close relationship, high correlation with LST and air temperature, and some that have found uh, quite different. And it really does depend, again, on that context. Uh, I have found in my own research that hotter, drier locations um, tend to have a, a, a lower correlation between the two, and then uh, more vegetated areas tend to have a much higher correlation between the two. There are differences. Uh, there are models, and the, the types of models I described earlier that we run uh, in the uh, Urban Climate Lab, they are the types of models that we use to derive air temperature, this more uh, canopy scale urban heat island. However, they are substantially more complex to run. Uh, they're not often uh, available publicly. And that's why they're not often used in this kind of analysis. Um, they are much more computationally intensive to run. They're often expensive. Uh, they need to be run on more of a city by city basis. Um, and this can make them 
uh, really uh, unavailable, unaccessible, uh, inaccessible to your average uh, urban planner or public health official who might want to use it for something like an HVI or more broadly an urban heat risk assessment. Uh, these are becoming more accessible over time, uh, but for now, many cities are having to turn to land surface temperature. It is available on a global scale. Um, it's a, a very high resolution um, and it's often free. Uh, and so this is an, an easy resource to recommend as a, a place to start. Um, and despite not having a perfect correlation with air temperature, it can still be helpful in determining, again, that relative priority. It can also be quite useful when locating some of your interventions. For example, even if there's not a very high correlation in your local context between land surface temperature and air temperature, it is very useful in determining where some interventions can be deployed. For example, where you are seeing very high surface temperatures because of low albedo, that is uh, very absorptive, uh, very dark colored uh, building materials, well, that tells you exactly where it would be most useful to uh, deploy more uh, high albedo materials. If you are going to be repaving a road anyway that is in a very hot area of the city, according to your land surface temperature, that may be an opportunity to be using a lighter building material uh, when you have that come through in your capital improvements plan. Uh, where you see very high uh, land surface temperature because of low vegetation, where you might bring in, say, another exposure variable like vegetation, and we're going to talk more about that next time, um, then let's, uh, we, we can then use that information to help us determine where we should put those trees. So it can still be quite useful. Um, and uh, unfortunately, at the time uh, being, these uh, air temperature models are just not very accessible. So we're leaning on this, this uh, accessibility of the LST for tools such as these. Great, uh, Evan, thank you so much. Uh, moving on to question number 10. With regard to reducing urban heat island effects, are the existing nature-based solutions capable of coping with existing and future anticipated heat waves? As per the World Meteorological Organization predictions for 2021 to 25, at least one year out of it would witness a year where we cross one degree, uh, one and a half degrees centigrade, and I'm assuming that's an increase in average temperature. Sure. So uh, I, I can, can address this. Go ahead, Katie. No, Evan, you're better suited to answer that. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, yes, this is a great question because this is something that we tackle quite a bit in the Urban Climate Lab. This is um, we we actually specialize in um, local climate change. That is the urban heat island, the drivers of the urban heat island. And in fact, we find that the urban heat island um, and these microclimates that are generated by the urban heat island are actually far greater in magnitude even now than the scale of warming that we anticipate even by mid or end of century. So this is why we're so heavily focused on the local climate change, because uh, we have so much more control over this local climate than we generally do over the global atmospheric climate change. So uh, in, in our research and others, we find that uh, vegetative strategies can actually cool local air temperatures by up to uh, two to nine degrees uh, Fahrenheit. I apologize, I am American, I speak in Fahrenheit. Um, but these magnitudes can be quite high um, with uh, just those local microclimates. So, what what emerging research is is still showing though is is just how much we uh, we can rely on these types of strategies to address this kind of local heat exposure. And in fact, when we hit a high enough magnitude of a a heat wave or an extreme heat event, research has found that the effectiveness, the cooling magnitude of these uh, strategies can actually diminish. There's kind of a diminishing return to them. So we can't fully rely on them, but they can be quite helpful. And so on a local scale, on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, and even collectively on an urban heat island scale, uh, we do actually have quite a bit of control over this local climate, depending on the size and scale uh, and type of strategies that we deploy. Uh, 
So this research is ongoing, but what we've seen so far is actually quite promising in terms of actually addressing this kind of warming that we are seeing, again, on a local scale. Wonderful, yeah, so thank you so much, Evan. Uh, moving on to question 11, what are examples of construction methods that create differences in outcomes? So I'm not sure if I understand the question entirely, um, but what we present are, you know, the an increasing complexity of the different types of HVI construction methods. Um, what we have found in some of our own research is that when you use one of the most complex methods, which is the PCA, and I see we have some other questions about this, there are some um, differences in the types of outputs that you get um, depending on the inputs that you use. So rather than comparing across uh, construction methods, we've, we've looked at how within the method there is variability in that, in say the spatial distribution of areas identified to be most vulnerable uh, to heat. Um, so there might be opportunities, I think, to compare how these different construction methods uh, are sensitive to each other. Um, meaning, could you look at, say, an, a weighted overlay um, and compare it to a PCA derived HVI? Sure. Uh, I'm not sure if there is a method that does that inherently so that you can then see some disparate change um, in vulnerability from those methods. Uh, remember, the HVI itself is, is showing relative um, relationships to heat vulnerability. So in some ways, you are seeing some differences um, in, in vulnerability outcome. Um, but in terms of whether there are methods that can show you differences um, between the two, between different construction methods, I'm not familiar with that. Um, yeah. So I think if, I don't know if Evan wants to add anything. No, I, I think you covered it well. Yeah, the um, uh, what we discussed in today's uh, session is, is really just a, an overview of how these construction methods can influence the differences in outcomes. But it, it really does highlight that this is going to be unique to your choices and your city. Each of the decisions you make will influence those outcomes. So it's more important in how you use your HVI than treating your HVI as the absolute truth and basing all of your policies on it. Wonderful, thank you, Evan and Katie. And looking at the time, we are less than two minutes until the conclusion of part two of this webinar series. So I think this is a good place to stop. I do want to reiterate, uh, I think it's been mentioned before, that for everybody that uh, posed a question in today's uh, training, we will be going through and answering all of them and posting this Q&A transcript to the training page, uh, ideally before uh, Tuesday, so part three of the training. So if you did ask a question, uh, rest assured we will address it and we will post it to the training page. And for those that attended, hopefully all of you, part one, uh, if you're interested in the Q&A transcript, that has also uh, already been posted to the training page. So you now have access to that. So if you asked a question in part one and you didn't hear it answered live, then do please uh, refer to the training page. As we wrap up, I wanna thank everybody that attended today, all the participants, wherever you're joining us from. Thank you so much for taking your time to learn about how to construct heat vulnerability indices and why they're so important to characterize uh, uh, different risks and different vulnerabilities within urban areas. Really excited because in, in part two, we will be joined again by Dr. Evan Mallon and Dr. Kathleen Conlin, and they'll be walking us through how to construct heat, vulnerab heat vulnerability indices. And then we'll be providing time for you to be able to uh, take those methodologies and adapt them to your own urban area of interest. So we hope everybody will join us next Tuesday for part three of this four-part webinar series. Again, a big thanks to both Dr. Evan Mallon and Dr. Kathleen Conlin. Uh, uh, thank you so much for, for uh, presenting today. And I also want to thank the entire RSET team. Uh, that's Selwyn hudson Odoy, Jonathan O'Brien, uh, Sarah Cutshell, and Brock Blevins, as well as my colleague Amita Mekta. So 
Thank you everybody for joining today. Stay safe if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, stay cool, and we look forward to seeing you all next Tuesday. Thank you.